It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. Thanks for joining us, folks. I'm Sam LaSant. So, folks, let me ask you a question. What do you know about an investigative reporter that works at a television station? Number one, why do we need an investigative reporter? And number two, what do they do? I probably have one of the best investigative reporters uh, that I know of, and, and I've been around for a long time, as you know. Uh, this guy is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've, I've known him throughout the years. He's thorough, he's honest, he's sincere, and he works for one of the best stations I know, WNEP-TV, and you know I'm talking about Dave Bowman. Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, well, it's an honor to be here. Thanks uh, for having me, Sam. You know, uh, uh, it's interesting because I had Scott Schaefer on, I had... Um, Tom Clark on, and we talk about, you know, what you guys do. First of all, I mentioned about WNEP. I want to come right up front. I think WNEP is one of the finest TV stations in, in the country, and I'll tell you why. All of you who work there, including the management and ownership, they always give back as much as they can to northeastern and central Pennsylvania. You do golf tournaments. Uh, who does the run? Seneca, okay, Ryan. I mean, everyone, and I don't want to miss anyone, they always do so much for the area. Well, it's easy for me. I never met a golf tournament I didn't like. Yeah. But, but besides that, it is ingrained ab about giving back. It's expected of you. They don't keep records and don't say, hey, you haven't done any public service. But before you get in, even at the job interview process, you're told this is expected of you. Um, it's a good chance for us to meet the people uh, that we cover. More importantly, it's, it's important for us to meet the people that watch us on a regular basis and support us. And uh, there are some very good causes we're affiliated. I do golf tournaments for the Little Sisters of the Poor. I do one for the Boy Scouts of Columbia, Montour County. The challenge, obviously, is to get to as many places as possible. And uh, um, because I'm still, because I still don't have as much seniority as others, I'll be further away from Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, and I'm okay with that. I really mm -hmm. uh, enjoy uh, doing that, and uh, it's a fun way to spend my free well, time. Well, you, you work for a great station. Uh, now, let's talk about you, Dave, okay? Tell the, the, our viewers a little bit about yourself, and then I want to get into what you do, okay? Well, I'm uh, somebody who spent the last uh, 38 years working in television news. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a sportscaster. Uh, I thought it would be the perfect way uh, to end my Hall of Fame baseball career is to work into the box because they tell you to prepare for something. Obviously, things didn't work out that way. And when I went to college, I was very lucky at Syracuse University. One of the things that was, they have you know, some of the great sportscasters, Bob Costas, Dick Stockton, Greg Papa, you can go on and on. Uh, there's a long list of people who are very successful. I'll even mention our own Landon Stoller, uh, of people who at Syracuse University have gone on to bigger and better things. What I didn't like was the fact that you would have to really start at the bottom, like sweeping floors at the radio show. And I had, you know, with sports and with other things, I had too much to do and wasn't into it. The other thing is that on education, when I was able to learn things like world affairs and politics, I was really interested in these classes. These are things I would have blown off at high school, but at a, uh, a, you know, a maturity level where I was like, I don't want to do sports. I want to do the news part. And when I've gotten to work in bigger markets where they have pro sports teams in Tampa, you realize that most of the athletes see the media as your enemy. They don't want you around. And I'd rather be a fan than be the enemy. So it, it all worked out for the best in that sense. Um, and it developed a passion really for investigative reporting on a couple of stories I did early on. Was able to get some specialized training for it. When I worked in Tampa, I, I was sent to the uh, investigative reporters and editors boot camp where you really learn how to get data, process it. Just the technical things that will set you apart from just everyday reporting. And, and that's the interesting thing. So I, I opened and said, who, who needs an investigative reporter? Okay, because, all right, so um, talking about investigative reporting, all right, so what is your day like? Well, it, the first question is, is am I going to be on the air that day or not? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer is, I don't know. I have projects that are long-term, medium, and short-term. Um, and about half of what I do on air has already been completed 
a day or two or three before, and it's set up in promo for some investigative reports. There are things that are follow-ups on stuff I might have done that I may have to go out that morning and put together for the newscast that mm -hmm. day. And it may be a day where I'm trying to advance stories that I've worked on for 15, 20 hours. Like for example, when I leave here, I'll be headed out to central Pennsylvania to do a couple of interviews uh, for a longer term story I, I'm working on over um, some very uneven, let's just say very uneven enforcement of a, a very important law. Uh, so sometimes I'll be in house, sometimes I'll be out shooting, sometimes I'll be working for news of the day and it can all change obviously during the vacation times and, and if you have a flu epidemic or something like that it'll be put your investigates on hold we've got a couple of important stories and you're the only one that can do it. All right so how, how do you get a story uh, number one number two why do we need an investigative TV reporter when you have the law that you should go to the law okay and and it, so there's this question well, let, me, let me let me answer your second question first the, the reason you need investigative reporting because everybody will give you a different definition of it my definition of investigative reporting is to bring forth important news that otherwise the public would never know about. And my job is, is to be the watchdog, primarily of local and state government, and to make sure that I do my best to try to unearth things that people need to know about that they otherwise wouldn't be able to know about had it not been for that kind of work. Um, the other advantage of it is, is that when you have important news um, you can go in the the advantage of being an investigative reporter you can go in depth you can look at regional trends and you can give the kind of stories that aren't just news of the day but require the depth and explanation of of what's going on and it takes a special training to be able to do that it's something that not every reporter can do and it's not something that you can go out at nine and come back and get on the air by six so okay so now uh, you get um a lot of mail or calls. We okay. get 250 calls or emails every week. Wow. At, that's a, a little more of my time than I'd like to spend yeah. on. And, and when you put that into perspective, I'm sorry, every month, when you put that into perspective, we do about six stories every month that are under the investigative banner. We, we don't do more because we want them to feel like they're a special, impactful report. And if we were to do them every day, they would have kind of a watered down sort of look and feel about them. So there's a few things we separate right off the bat. One of the value of having hotlines and emails are people that tell us things that really aren't investigative reports, but they're pretty good stories. And I'll go ahead and call other reporters who might work a geographical beat going, here's something that's going on. Um, but we'll have about 10 out of those 250, maybe 15, that are worth another look. I'll make a follow-up call. I'll pitch what I think is important to my bosses. Sometimes they'll agree, sometimes they'll say, what you got number five on your list should be number one on your list, and we go from there. Okay, so now uh, when, you're, when you're dealing investor reporters, when you said local and state government, okay, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have winners and losers. You have people who are happy, people who are sad, people who, have, who, who want to get who are vindictive. Uh, so what happens is Sam LaSant lost and his people are upset and we're going to get that person who won, okay. And now we're going to try to find everything so we could call Dave Bowman and say, Dave, you know, this competitor who, you know, okay. So now, so now here's, how do you detect, you know, what, if it is a, a vindictive type thing and they have sour grapes, and then how do you keep your personal bias from that story? I'm talking to, hold that, I'm talking to Dave Bowman. To come back, we're gonna answer that question, folks. It's interesting because, you know, sometimes you have uh, people who don't like people, and sometimes they make up things, and sometimes there is a little uh, smoke there. <clears throat> it's up for Dave to find out if it's gonna be factual, but when Dave goes on the case, let's say he's pro something, and he uh, does he carry his bias with that when he's doing his investigative reporting? We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the Sam Lasant Show, folks. Remember, 24/7, SSPTV.com. 
uh, download our app, search SSP TV, download the app, all of our shows are on there. And folks, for those people who do not have uh, cable, uh, download YouTube, search SSP TV, subscribe, and you can watch all of our shows. My guest today, Dave Bowman, is an investigative reporter for WNAP TV. Uh, and uh, Dave, I said to you before, okay, so now you have a vindictive person who loses it bitter. They're too, they want to get as much dirt as they can on their opposition. And uh, now, you know, they send you something. You better watch out because these guys stealing, he's doing this. So Dave Bowman gets this. And Dave happens to be, um, you know, a little biased, okay? He didn't like this party or that party. And so... I'm going to go after that. Does that ever ha enter into, into your mind? There's two kinds of bias that you can be accused of. And sometimes, uh, sometimes the people that call bias on reporters are right. Most of the time they're wrong. But there are two biases. There's personal bias. There's issue bias. Personal bias is you just don't like the person. Hey, you might agree with a lot of what they do. Or you might like the person a lot. And, uh, but even backtracking further, when you get a tip that somebody's doing something, even if it's vindictive related, the first words out of my mouth are, prove it. What kind of proof do you have? I mean, it doesn't matter where things come from. It matters if they're true or not. And it's up to me and, more importantly, my team and the groups of people to determine whether it's newsworthy, whether it's relevant, whether the public served by putting this information and making it public. Um, the where it came from, it matters, but if somebody, if candidate A is, is angry that he lost and has some information about candidate B that the public really does need to know about, then you have to listen to all comers. Now, getting back to the bias of issues, that's never been a problem for me. Um, early on, I learned not to get too wrapped up in things. If I have one exception, it's freedom of the media issues, and I think it's okay to be adversarial about that. Um, for example, I think Pennsylvania should have cameras in the courtroom. I think the public would be better served if they got to see the Hugo Selinsky trial. I think Pennsylvania would be better served if personnel records of public employees were available to the public so we could see what type. I mean, we're, we pay their bills. You know, they work for us. We should be able to see them. So the only time that I can be accused of bias, I think, is when I'm looking at advocacy stuff for First Amendment issues and freedom of the press. When you're looking at you know, issues like abortion or gun control that people have very hardened sides on. I don't have a strong bias either way, and I'm very comfortable reporting on, on things like that. As far as a personal bias goes, I'm pretty good at checking my, I'm very good at checking my feelings at the door. If I might not particularly like somebody, I'm good at being fair. The hardest part is you really generally have a friendship with somebody and a good working professional relationship, and you have to do a story that's not going to reflect well on them. That's difficult. You just have to fight through it and work through it and be fair. Yeah. That's, I, I, that's so true. Just a side note is I, with our news, we had one retailer in Hazleton didn't advertise with us for like seven, eight years. And so finally when I went to them and I finally got them on, uh, uh, I said, whatever happened? He said, well, you covered that story when, when my garage burned. I said, I said well, <laughs> why, you, we covered your story. You, you, you didn't have to cover was the front page in the standard speaker the next day. I said, that's, so that's why you didn't advertise with me? I mean, so sometimes there's little things, Dave, that tick yeah. people off. Um, all right, so you get this, you get this you know, case or, or concern. Now, I know what you've done personally for a few cases, and I've known that you've been up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning taking pictures and making sure that you, you, know, you cover all your uh, bases. Where does the legal team come in here, okay? So Dave doesn't go and really screw up, okay? Even though you know you have all your facts, even though you feel, et cetera, you need a legal team, don't, am yeah. I correct? And, and I would say about maybe 20 to 30% of what I do does get a legal review. Uh, and three things happen. It'll be, yeah, it's fine, go with it. It'll be revise this and that. We're not sure that this is, you know, this is too inflammatory. Change your wording on it. We could be held liable for this. And there's, we, and it's happened to me once where don't run it. You would be in legal jeopardy if you did. 
even though you think you have your bases covered. Just to let you know, it was uh, during the trial of a couple of Lackawanna commissioners, there were 10 unnamed businesses that were unindicted co-conspirators. We were able to get the names of those businesses. And the reason we were told don't run it is because there was always a possibility of a plea bargain. And these unnamed people, you would have had to prove that they were named if you went ahead and, and went out with it. And you'd damage your reputation. And you probably wouldn't have the kind of, you know, backing and fact-based evidence that you'd have if, if this happened. So I, I, mean, I actually was relieved when, you know, the lawyer said, don't go with the story, knowing the full thing. So why, why go to you and, and you know, send a, a tip to you? Why not go to law enforcement? You know, if, if, if you feel that something, someone's doing something illegal and, you know, if it's especially local and state, why don't go to the law? Why, why to go Dave Bowman? Sometimes it's better to go to law enforcement, but the times where it is usually better to go to me than law enforcement, if you have something that absolutely needs to be told, you can back it up with a wall of facts and law enforcement might not be doing anything about it. Um, that is the best explanation I can give that with you. The other thing is the things that we expose are not necessarily criminal activity. I mean, if you were one of our recent investigations involved, um, involved a, uh, you know, involved a subdivision, this last story we did in North Pittston where the roads are horrific, People aren't getting the help. There's a dispute over who should pay for the fix up and all that. And the estate of the developer is just about out of money. You're not going to do any good going to law enforcement because, you know, a lot of what we do, if not most of what we do, is something that law enforcement really can't tackle. So are you saying to me that most of um, all of your cases are from people who contact you? No, no. We have, the majority are. Some of them are from ideas through the corporate, hey, this made a good story, you might want to look at this. Here's a social trend you need to look at. Um, I'm a big numbers guy. I believe the best investigative reports very often have to do with numbers and showing you know, what county might be doing a good job, might not be doing on it, and I'll just take it, I'll reinterpret it, it's part of my training. And, sh and be able to put the focus on one part of uh, the 570, if you will, and say, you need to do your job better. How much personal stamina you, do you need to have to do what you do? Because believe me, sometimes you, I'm on a, when we come back in the break, I want you to talk about one of your most bizarre cases and some of the cases that you had. And, but you have to have that fortitude and be concerned because there's a lot of wackos out there. They can pull the gun on you and shoot you. I'm talking, hold that thought. Talking to Dave Bowman, folks, he's got a tough job, investigative reporter. Uh, no one likes to be uh, investigated. And if you're doing something wrong, well, then you know why you're being investigated. We come back, what happens, you know, what does it take? Does he go with, uh, other than a cameraman, or does he go with a constable? Does he go with a cop or whatever when he has to confront someone? Be back right after this. Welcome back to the Sam LaSanne Show, folks, 24-7 SSP TV. Download our app, SSP TV, and also uh, download YouTube, subscribe SSP TV, and subscribe and you watch all our shows. Investigative reporter Dave Bowman from WNEP is on the show today. So, Dave, there are a lot of crazy people in this world. Uh, and now you got a real hot case, okay, you, and you have to go and confront the person. Um, do you go with police protection? Do you go other than with a cameraman? I mean, because you don't know who's going to answer that door and who's going to put a bullet in your head. Uh, the, ans the answer is no. If you feel that there's a serious risk, that's a time where you just might back off. I mean, if there's something that needs to be done. Uh, the times when reporters have been in danger, number one, working overseas, obviously that doesn't apply uh, to local news. Number two, um, is when you're on live TV because you don't have control of the background or anything like that. We've had a couple of incidents. At a, I know Peggy Lee got assaulted at a St. Patrick's Day parade a couple of years ago, and that's where you might want to take two or three other people. When you're, Live TV, to me, is more risky than confronting somebody. Um, in terms of adverse reaction as an investigative reporter, 
somebody who doesn't want you to get something out there is more likely to do it via lawyers in court than they are with a gun. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say you don't have to be sobering about it. And I've had a couple of times in my career, once where we were covering hurricanes in Florida, where I worked for nine years, and you had people that were desperate, people that hadn't eaten, people that needed gas, and we we're in a satellite truck that had an ample supply of all three, where we were told, be careful, there's some death, that's yeah. a time to worry about. There was another time when I was working in Dayton, Ohio, when I was a nightside reporter. There was a guy who committed a murder, went to a downtown hotel, got a room on the second to top floor, and he was actually firing pot shots in downtown Dayton. Now, he didn't hit anybody. But during one of my live shots, because it lasted into the morning, I was, at a safe, I was in a safe place, by the way. You couldn't, in other words, he wouldn't have had a direct line at me. But what he did have, what was a little bit sobering, and it reminds you of the danger, is um, during a live shot, it just felt something hit the ground near me. And it was about 15 feet away. My photographer saw a little bit of a flash. I happened to be on live and only, only just remembered that is in that area there was you know, a flattened bullet that was hot. So, wow. you know, again, he couldn't have shot directly. We took the precautions of being behind the building, but it was close enough to make you realize this could be a dangerous profession. So that leads me into what was the most bizarre case that you had to investigate? I mean, I'm sure this, but what, what, what pops in your mind is the most bizarre? The, the weirdest case that I ever did happened to be in Burlington, Vermont, when I was a brand new reporter. And there was an elderly couple that wanted to get married. He was about 85 and she was about 70. And they were first cousins. And they wanted the state to waive the rules to allow them to be married. And, uh, you know, because obviously cousins aren't allowed to marry, um, uh, you know, because of birth defects and things like that. But one of the most bizarre things is it passed the Senate unanimously because they were like, what harm could it be? And the backlash was, do you know what kind of can of worms you're opening? Don't do it. And they never were. They lived together. They were allowed to be married. But, and he died like three months after. Oh. This, this whole event. That was a weird story and it was hard to tell. And then just, just plain bizarre. Um, you know, right now off the top of my head, nothing around here, you know, really jumps out at me. Everything's been pretty straightforward uh, investigative stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that would be, well, I, I can't it, have anything that it, jumps at me. I, I, there's, there's so many stories that you do, but the, the, the fact is that, you know, I can see why you won so many Emmys. Well, and, you. you know, um, I, I think, you know, what you do is, is, you know, when some people say they're investor reporters, well, okay, but you are an investigative reporter. Well, thank you. Because you do it for A to, a to Z. Uh, what, do you, what do you tell viewers on, before they send you something? What, what? What should they send you if, they, if they're going to send you other than trivial things? Back up your claim with as much evidence as possible. Um, and make sure that if you think you're victimized, that you're not alone. In other words, what we don't do is if it's one person in one business, we're likely to stay away from that. I mean, you can have a decent running business and one unhappy customer and might be wrong. That doesn't justify an investigative report. But if it's a scam, and many people have been... Uh, right. And we had, for example, we did a story uh, about a, a used car dealer that has since shut down, um, where the Attorney General, we, we had a bunch of complaints. The Attorney General had 30 documented cases of wrongdoing. Well, hey, Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It's always nice to have you on the show. Dave Bowman, folks, uh, investigative reporter at WNEP. You also see him on the news desk. I like him on the news desk, but he, <laughs> he likes his job, investigative reporter. Um, uh, remember, 24-7 SSP TV, uh, and thank you so much for all the nice comments we're getting on the Sam Losan Show. Dave, thanks for coming on Thanks the show. for having me. It was okay. an honor. We'll see you next time.